and welcome to today's MIT Press Live event. Uh, if you've been tuning in regularly over the last few weeks, you might be wondering who I am um, and where Hannah, our normal host, has got to. Uh, well, she is taking a well-earned vacation. Um, but my name is Katie Stalman. I'm the head of publicity at MIT Press, and I'm filling in for her. And really excited to be speaking today with Maureen Webb who's the author of Coding Democracy, How Hackers Are Disrupting Power, Surveillance and Authoritarianism. I think in the last two weeks particularly, there have been a huge number of conversations about uh, power structures, authority. Maureen, it's great to have you with us. Where are you calling in from today? I'm here in Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada today. Well, Good thank morning. you so much for joining us. Good morning. Um, and why don't you start by uh, telling us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Sure. Well, I, I'm a Canadian labor and constitutional lawyer, uh, a civil liberties activist and a writer. I was very much involved in the civil liberties fallout of the anti-terrorism measures adopted by states after 9-11, including the case of Mayor Arar here in Canada. Uh, he was the Canadian who was rendered by the U.S. to torture and detention in Syria. And I teach comparative national security law and state of exception law from time to time as an adjunct professor. Uh, I wrote a book in 2007 that received a fair amount of attention called Illusions of Security, Global Surveillance and Democracy in the Post-9-11 World. It was published six years before the Snowden revelations about domestic and global spying by the U.S. National Security Agency. And uh, really, it, it predicted much of what his leaks revealed about the scope of government and private sector surveillance and its dangers for democracy. Thank you, Maureen. Now, you've written a new book for MIT Press. Can you tell us a little bit about what that is about? Mm -hmm. Coding Democracy uh, is, it, it's got a longer title, Coding Democracy, How Hackers Are Disrupting Power, Surveillance and Authoritarianism. It reports on a phenomenon in the current political landscape that many have been missing, I think. The rapid spread of hacker culture and its potency to disrupt concentrations of power, the mass surveillance, and the growing authoritarianism that have become the defining features of these first decades of the 21st century. Uh, the book provides a reader with really a one-stop history of hackers and the genealogy of hacker ideas. So in that respect, it's, it's a timely update on Stephen Levy's seminal book, Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution, that many of the listeners will be familiar with. But at its heart uh, is my reporting on the burgeoning progressive hacker scene coalescing around the Chaos Computer Club in Europe and how hacking is being embraced by citizens as a practice, an ethos, and a metaphor. Uh, so in this sense, hacking is a new kind of social activism, which is all about distributed, demo distributed democracy, distributed power, and distributed decision making. So what did you mean to communicate by the title Coding Democracy? The, the title Coding Democracy uh, alludes to a hacker thesis that Larry Lessig uh, of Harvard Law famously expounded on. Uh, that is the idea that code is law. Um, so that in a world of ubiquitous computing, the self-executing nature of code will largely determine our relationships and rights and even undermine constitutional guarantees if we don't pay attention to it. Uh, the, the, the title Coding Democracy is also meant to suggest that um, well, it's meant to suggest that computer code more than law is going to determine what kind of societies we live in and whether they end up resembling democracies at all. But it's also meant to very much place agency in the hands of people. The, the book does not take a utopian or deterministic view of technology. Uh, so coding democracy also means what do citizens need to put in place in the digital age to make democracies work? How can societies hold on to and build out democracy in the digital age? Uh, in many ways, the, the book is about how hackers and citizens are taking Occupy into the digital age. And I link the burgeoning hacker movement to Occupy, to the Arab Spring, the Ignatos movement, the 2008 financial crisis, and the current popular revolt against neoliberal policies. 
And I report on a, on a whole array of hacking experiments that are underway right now that I feel could fundamentally change the present political economy. So I, I believe that the book shows that hacking as a phenomenon is going to have profound implications as the 21st century unfolds. Maureen, thank you. Uh, a lot of what you're speaking about, a lot of the uh, terms that you're using, I think will be very familiar to people um, who've been watching the news over the last couple of weeks. But this, this book, you know, you began writing uh, some time ago. It published in March, but um, I think we acquired it about two years before that. So, so what inspired you to write the book initially? Well, of course, as a constitutional lawyer, I've been concerned about the erosion of democratic norms since 9-11. Um, I, I kept thinking, as others did, that our constitutions in the West would be strong enough to roll back abuses as they were uncovered. But gradually, I began to realize that this was not going to happen. And, you know, if you look at the pervasive, the pervasive illegality that states and corporations are engaged in with their uses of digital technology and the, the seeming inability of existing legal regimes to govern that activity, it, it was manifest to me that the law was collapsing. So I began to realize that code, more than law, was going to determine the kind of societies we live in. And I, I came to this in a dim, uh, <laughs> a fairly dim way, um, before I discovered the writing of uh, Larry Lessig, and of course that, that illuminated it uh, greatly. Um, and hackers have, have, have been conveying a similar idea for, for, for many years before Larry Lessig started to work, uh, to, to talk about it. Um, but yeah, I began to realize that code more than law was going to determine whether our democracy, democracies were, were preserved. Um, and so the, the question occurred to me, who controls code? This seems uh, to be a very urgent civics question to me. There's really a struggle taking place right now uh, among various elements to build the coded environment around us. And ordinary users and citizens are really at the mercy of the code makers. So hackers are shamans in this space. They, they are the savants. They are the, the new shamans who mediate between the the powers that be and the interests of the citizen because they they know how to code um, i was familiar like many of your listeners would be with this the negative stereotype of hackers as, as dangerous nihilistic elements in society and the, these are real threats i don't mean to minimize them but this is really only one part of the hacker story and I knew enough starting this project to believe that hackers might also be vital disruptors in the emerging digital environment with its severe anti-democratic tendencies. So in what way do you believe that hackers are vital disruptors? Well, it, it's quite concrete really. Um, where there has been the growth of surveillance capitalism and state social control, Hackers have been developing tools for civilian encryption and privacy. Where there has been information wars that have nearly overwhelmed our democratic election processes in the West, hackers have been fighting for transparency and a fact-based reality. Where there's been commer commercialization and sequestering of the internet, hackers have tried to ensure net neutrality and decentralization. Where there's been proprietary closed code and a huge shift of property rights uh, to software owners through digital rights management locks and related laws. Hackers have proven the value of free software. Um, the free software many of your listeners will be familiar with is code that can be studied, questioned, built upon, repurposed and shared. Um, they've proven its value time and time again. It it's really now forms the backbone of the, the digital world. Um, and they fought for an end uh, to, to, to digital rights management practices. And finally, where platform monopolies, the, the Amazons, the Googles, the Ubers of the world, uh, Facebooks, where they're killing local economies, hackers have innovated ways of breaking these up through alternative platforms and business models that we could begin to build a new economy around. Uh, so those are the major contributions of hackers. And I think as important as the technical experimentation they're undertaking, hackers are beginning to teach the rest of us 
what is at stake in this emerging era. That is why privacy, transparency, data self-determination, net neutrality, commons-based production, and free software could be as important to a new age of, of democracy as the great organizing principles of liberty, fraternity, and egalité, as we say in Canada, um, were to the Enlightenment era of democracy. So this is something I cover in depth in the middle of the book, really the desperate need that we have for a whole new civics education a digital era civics so that citizens can begin to see the world that is rapidly changing around them as clearly as hackers and technologists see it. That's brilliant. Thank you, Maureen. Um, it'd be great if we could talk a little bit about the history of hacking um, and particularly I'm interested to know how hacking has evolved over time as quite a recent phenomenon. Yes, uh, I spent uh, the first four chapters or so uh, covering the, the early history of hacking. Um, and to give you a brief description, hacking, the, the term was coined at MIT in the 1950s. Uh, it began around early mainframe computers with young programmers who developed an ethic that journalist Stephen Levy observed and summarized in his book. Um, the Levy some summary of the ethic is is not necessarily what every hacker group has ascribed to since, but it's certainly been very influential in the contemporary hacker scene, uh, who quote it almost verbatim. And broadly speaking, uh, the central tenet of the hacker ethos is the hands-on imperative, what they call the hands-on imperative. Uh, the idea that one should be able to take systems apart, to study and interrogate them, to modify them and repurpose them, and to share be able to share one's uh, modifications without restrictions. And, and the hacker ethos with its hands-on imperative has had a profound influence on digital technology since the early days. Uh, hackers were the original innovators of Silicon Valley. They have made an immense contribution in the development of free software through new Linux, that's GNU slash Linux. Uh, many people are familiar with it just with the name Linux, new Linux and, and projects like the Debian project. Um, so that, you know, free software has really become the backbone of the digital world. It's used in almost, um, uh, you know, all commercial and uh, government systems. Um, hackers were key players. Many people might not, not know this, but hackers were key players in the Arab Spring and the Occupy movement. And since the early 2000s, there's been an exponential growth of the pro progressive hacker scene in which hackers and citizens are working together to try to guarantee citizens' privacy, to bring transparency and accountability to those in power, to realize the social and economic goals of Occupy in the digital era, and to really upgrade democratic processes themselves. Um, also, something that I report on towards the end of the book is that in the last decade or two, there's been a fascinating mainstreaming and institutionalization of hacker ideas and experiments in places like Harvard, MIT, and, and Stanford on the West Coast um, that I think really underscore the rising significance of hacking as a phenomenon. And, and this mainstreaming has garnered new respectability and resources for hacker experiments. Uh, it's had both positive and negative effects, uh, which I, I analyze and discuss uh, in the last chapter of the book. Um, but before we leave the history of hacking, of course, two of the most momentous, story, momentous stories in the short history of hacking are those of Julian Assange and Edward Snowden. Um, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, which published leaked information about states and oligarchs that that has ushered in an age of unprecedented transparency in global politics. And, um, and the story of Edward Snowden, who revealed the extent, the astonishing extent to which the US has been violating privacy around the world. Um, and drawing from these two examples, uh, the contemporary hacker scene, what has emerged from the contemporary hacker scene, and I've, I've not been able to find who, who was the author of this manifesto, but it's a short one, and you might have heard it uh, yourselves, uh, which is privacy for the weak, transparency for the powerful. 
um, privacy and transparency being two fundamental conditions for a functioning democracy. Privacy guarantees autonomy and security in one's personal sphere and thoughts. And transparency is really the only anecdote, uh, antidote to misguided and uh, or corrupt governance. Um, so this contemporary manifesto, I think, is a profoundly democratic one. And so also, I argue in the book, is uh, the contemporary progressive hacker scene. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Maureen. And we're going to get a little bit more into the substance of the book very shortly. But I thought before we did that, um, it'd be great for you to talk a little bit more about the approach you took with the writing, particularly as at MIT Press, we publish several books on hacking and uh, the phenomenon that you cover. What makes this book different even from other books that we've published? Uh, yes, I think it's quite different from uh, most titles that MIT Press uh, publishes. Um, it's not an academic book. It's not a popular academic book, uh, although it did go through a thorough peer review process like other MIT Press titles. It, it, uh, Coding Democracy is really a narrative nonfiction. And that, that I think is a very appropriate genre for uh, such a large uh, a subject. Um, it's, it's an open texture genre that I think allows people to apprehend and, and really ruminate on a subject of this size. And uh, I should just add that there's a beautiful foreword by science fiction writer, hacker and digital activist, uh, Cory Doctorow in the book, um, which people will enjoy. Uh, Coding democracy is in many ways an odyssey, if you like, uh, because in following the thread of the story, I traveled to Berlin, to the chaos camp somewhere in the German countryside, to Barcelona, Rome, Boston, Cambridge, Vancouver, San Francisco, and even the, the Gulf Islands in the Salish Sea. Um, and, and in many respects, uh, it, it's also an every man's journey. Um, and I think that I am that every person. I'm not a hacker or a technologist, not an academic who studies hackers, but really an ordinary computer user. Uh, I'm a trade unionist being a labor lawyer. I'm a parent trying to raise children and one of millions of citizens in Western countries concerned about our democracies in this century. Um, so, so the book is written for the ordinary concerned reader. Uh, it's also written for the hacker and the tech insider. And I felt very strongly about this. Uh, the book is there for them to reflect on where hacking has come from and where it might be going. And more importantly, on uh, the processes by which the knowledge that they possess can urgently be transferred to the mind of the ordinary citizen. Excellent. Well, you did um, promise that you would read us a little section of the book to give us a taster. Would you be happy to do that now? Sure. Um, the book is also meant to um, provide a sweeping historical context, and it reflects a lot on the 20th century, uh, the lessons from the 20th century, um, particularly about totalitarianism and authoritarianism and uh, concentrations of power and wealth. Um, and um, Berlin, uh, which through which much of the contemporary hacker story uh, intersects uh, is become almost a character in the narrative. Um, and the book begins with the reverie on the place and its connection to hacking. And it also happened to be the place that I landed on my way through to the uh, 2015 chaos communications camp. Um, so I'll read, I'll read for you. In Berlin, Berlin still has many bombed out lots. If you peer in behind the meshed fences, you see deep craters that sink precipitously under a cover of decades old trees. These holes seem to perforate the psyche as well as the landscape of the city. Some are the size of city blocks, some the size of small neighborhoods, and some are just green spaces where large tracts of city and inhabitants have ceased to exist as geographic facts. In photos of the post-war period, the Reichstag building is often visible, 
with Germans picking their way around its large defeated hulk on foot and on bicycles, the road a track of mud. The seat of German democratic government in Berlin, the Reichstag was notoriously set on fire in 1933, then scorned by Adolf Hitler, he never used it, and badly bombed by Allied planes. The Germans left it unreconstructed until well into peacetime, living with its wreckage until it was finally patched up for use in the 1960s and fully renovated in the 1990s. The dome of the renovated Reichstag echoes the burned out, twisted dome of the old building and is encased in glass, a symbol perhaps of both contrition and transparency. Walking around the bomb sites, the broken wall, and the sooty, uncared for imperial buildings of Berlin, a visitor might wonder whether these two values, contrition and transparency, can exercise the dark history of the place which in the 20th century went through multiple paroxysms, two wars of aggression, wild excess and inflation, mass deportations and murder, totalitarian surveillance, and a grim physical division. Despite a new German narrative of economic recovery and openness, Berliners still live amid the ruins of their elites, many bad decisions. They tend to be people with few illusions. It's no coincidence that a strong hacker culture has taken root here and flourished. Thank you so much, Maureen. Um, I hope that gives everyone a bit of a taste of uh, how wonderful the writing in this book is and also how sort of moving it is uh, at times. And it's full of uh, loads of incredible stories um, and accounts of uh, hackers and hacker groups um, and also hacker experiments. And that's where I want to move us on to now, Maureen, as we really kind of get into the, the content of the book. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of these hacker experiments that are, are underway at the moment? Yes, um, I, I report on, on, on a vast array of experiments and describe their technical aspects in detail. So that, you know, the book really paints a very broad picture, but it's very much gets into the nuts and bolts of the, um, of the tech. And um, uh, it's, it, it's really astounding when you start looking at, at the, 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 the breadth of these experiments. At the most ambitious level, uh, I'd say that hackers are engaged in, in trying to reinvent the internet, to trying to build out a new civilian internet that would be privacy secure, allow self-determination over one's own data um, and uh, ensure net neutrality and interoperability as a design feature. Um, the Chaos Communications Club has been working on, on that project since at least 2015. Uh, other actors are also in this space. Uh, the, I learned that the Defense Advanced Research Agency or DARPA, which uh, brought us Total, the Total Information Awareness Project uh, after 9-11, um, a very insidious uh, surveillance, mass surveillance project that, that was officially uh, dumped after public protest, but, but continued on in many ways. Um, they are also racing to build a new civilian internet. Uh, and the European Union also has an, an initiative called the Next Generation Internet, which it says will be human-centric. And uh, the Chaos Communication uh, Group has actually been asked to advise uh, uh, some of the committees working on that. Um, obviously, it's a large societal project uh, building a new internet, uh, not least because there's a whole uh, physical infrastructure that people forget about that spans um, the world, uh, you know, the, the lines that go under the, uh, under the oceans and the the circuiting uh, that, that largely happens is in the United States. Um, also, Tim Berners-Lee, the inventor of the World Wide Web uh, and one of the original hackers, uh, the hacker elders, has a new project for a new de re-decentralized web. I mean, he built it as a decentralized um, piece of technology, uh, but it, it increasingly has become centralized and his project is called Solid. Um, Hackers are building a plethora of leaking platforms. WikiLeaks was by no, it, it certainly inspired many leaking platforms. It wasn't the first and it certainly will not be the last. 
um, and these leaking platforms are holding governments and oligarchs accountable. Uh, there's global leaks, Balta leaks, Quebec leaks, Murdoch leaks, you, you name it. So hackers are building a plethora of leaking platforms. Um, they're also creating cooperative platforms that allow people to exchange value outside of the platform monopolies that are presently killing so much of our economies. Uh, and these platforms are for work, for social ends. Uh, there's a hacker 9-11 service that is meant to replace the 9-11 service that, um, uh, that puts so many uh, minorities in, uh, in mortal danger when police arrive uh, to answer their calls. Um, I think the ultimate hack will be to see platforms like Google, which uh, corners the market on search, Amazon, which purports or, or uh, whose ambition is to become the, 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 the capitalist market, uh, and Uber, which uh, is a, a company that controls transportation. The ultimate hack will be to see these platforms become utilities. Uh, because really, the thing about code is that it can be replicated at nearly zero cost. So the, 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 the um, obvious social question is, why should a handful of individuals seize the immense wealth and bounty of these platforms when we could run them as public utilities? Um, hackers are creating alternate cloud services, uh, both personal clouds that you can build for yourself and user replicated um, uh, clouds, so distributed cloud services. Um, they're creating data commons where people can control and share data for civic or health purposes. Uh, they're creating alternative social media platforms. Uh, for example, Mastodon is an open source alternative to Twitter. Elo was uh, a, an alternative uh, hackers uh, tried to create for Facebook. Uh, media, media Goblin is an alternative to Spotify. Uh, there's just dozens and dozens of these. Many of the experiments are using the federated tech of the existing internet, um, but hackers are also experimenting in peer-to-peer -peer technology and blockchain. And as many of your listeners would know, these latter two technologies are still in the early stages of development. So some of the experiments sound a little pie in the sky, but many are likely to be realized and, um, uh, and certainly as quantum computing comes on, that will add another layer of capacity. And when and if and when they are realized, they're going to begin to fundamentally change the political economy. Um, just to describe quickly, peer-to-peer -peer tech is best understood as a relational dynamic. It allows one-to-one -one exchange of value and, and, even, and distributed computing. Uh, without any centralized intermediary. So it is possible with peer-to-peer -to, -peer to build virtual supercomputers using the power of many individuals' uh, computers um, and, and to get rid of the centralized media intermediaries that we have now uh, in the digital environment, whether it's government, platform monopoly, uh, or even legacy institutions like the stock market or the fiat monetary system. But the problem with peer-to-peer -peer technology is that it can't guarantee trust. Uh, you have to trust your peers when there's no central authority to intervene or enforce standards. Uh, so blockchain technology has really been a revolutionary idea because it would solve this problem of trust. And it solves the problem of trust by creating an unalterable public ledger, ledger of transactions uh, that is then also distributed across many computers in the peer-to-peer -peer system, um, which adds to its, its uh, uh, unalterable, unalterability, if, if you will. Um, and, and it's a ledger that's created, as I understand it, by mathematic equations that fit together like links in a chain. So you can't alter or cut one of them out of the chain without, without knowing that, without seeing that. Or, or just you can't do it because each one builds upon the, the last mathematical equation. Um, and hackers are showing us that peer-to-peer -peer technology combined with blockchain technology could potentially allow us to create self-executing contracts 
uh, self-executing legal regimes and self-executing communities of trust, sometimes known as decentralized autonomous organizations, but really communities where the code itself uh, self-executes the rules um, between people. So you don't have to rely on the goodness of your peer. You rely on the code to execute the rules. And when you begin to think of it, this, um, these experiments um, point to the potential for, for replacing entirely corrupt legacy institutions. Um, so for example, you, you know, hackers are, are, are imagining the creation of virtual supercomputers that would be powerful enough to run large ventures such as alternative stock exchanges. Um, ones that would ensure that, um, uh, you know, that would fight against the financialization of the economy or at least tax uh, financial transactions um, so that they can be used to, to put to better use in society. Um, ventures that could replace uh, traditional banking and even monetary systems um, to rival the rig systems that we have today. Um, one of the prototypes that everybody knows about is Bitcoin. It has certainly has its flaws. And I do talk about um, those flaws and a reality check on where the Bitcoin technology is. But, but it, 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 it's really mind blowing uh, when you start to think about the potentials it has for completely changing the political economy. Um, hackers are creating prototypes for innovative micropayment systems that could pay users for their attention or effectively tax financial transactions and corporations like Amazon, Google, and Apple. Um, and this would increase the flow of money through local economies by distributing the bounty of technological advances more fairly. For a long time, hackers have been proselytizing the value of free software, which I discussed uh, earlier. Um, that software that can be scrutinized, modified, built upon, and shared without restriction. And uh, the, the new slash Linux and, and projects like the Debian project have proven that common space production makes better code. Um, and really free software might inspire us to ultimately adopt this kind of code as the basis of a new democratic commonwealth. Because as I said, once code is written, it can be reproduced at almost zero cost and used by everyone. And, and finally, and um, this is the second part of the book, uh, and I think really the, the really interesting part, I met some amazing people. Um, hacker experiments uh, are out there that could revolutionize democratic decision-making with algorithms that calibrate fairness, distribute influence, minimize resistance, and optimize buy-in for difficult policy choices. Maureen, that's really sort of where we come to the, the crux of the book and one of the reasons why it's so important and why we're so excited at MIT Press to publish it. Um, could you elaborate a little bit more about how some of these experiments could impact democratic processes? Yes. Um, well, as I said at the outset, hacking, I, I see hacking becoming a, process, a, a practice, an ethos, and a metaphor for a growing social movement in which ordinary citizens are taking the health of their democracies into their own hands. And in the second part of the book, I traveled to Italy uh, where the Cinque Stelle movement, the five star movement, is using a hacker platform to affect a mixture of direct participatory and representative democracy. And, uh, and I spoke to a couple of young MPs who had just been elected to parliament there. And they had some fascinating things to say about that community uh, uh, and about how its operating system worked on these different levels. Um, I went to Spain and uh, I uh, visited a hacker group that I had first met at the Chaos Communications Camp in 2015. Um, it's a hacker collective called Xnet. That is that that used a it famously used a hacker created platform called Global Leaks and participation of the of uh, uh, its digital rights and wider community um, to to force prosecutors to bring nearly a hundred bankers and politicians to trial for their role in the country's financial crisis of two thousand and eight 
And it was really interesting because they were saying, you know, we have to get over this sort of academic uh, parsing of, of hacker groups. You know, in, in our world, the old lady is also a hacker. You know, the old lady in black is calling up from the village and, and leaking stuff through our platform that's allowing us to bring down a whole government. And in fact, they did. They brought down the whole uh, Rahoy government uh, eventually. Um, I spoke to a colleague that I know through the civil liberties community in British Columbia, who is developing a, a really interesting new startup called Ethelo. And, uh, you know, he was telling me that large groups can be very smart. Uh, studies, you know, there's studies that uh, about collective intelligence where a large group can come up with a, a better estimate of something than the smartest experts. Um, and so his question was, how do we increase intelligence by adding more people to the decision making process? We're really limited by the necessity in, you know, outside of the digital world um, uh, to delegate decision making because you can't have decision making bodies of more than about 20 people effectively. Um, and, but with digital technology, uh, people are experimenting with the idea that you can use uh, algorithms and networks to distribute influence, to minimize resistance, to optimize buy-in, um, and even to identify ranges of policy choices. Uh, and so his, uh, his startup uh, is selling its services to the Canadian government, for example, to generate uh, ranges of policy choices and ranking them in order of their likelihood of being supported by a group. Um, and he says that you can even fine tune the levels of fairness in, in, uh, in, in these initiatives. Um, and what he envisions ultimately is an open source, common operating system for global democracy. I said to him, what, what, do, what happens if you corner the market on decision making? And he said, without a beat, um, global democracy. Uh, and that doesn't mean that it would be one uh, um, monolithic closed system, but rather a pluralism of smaller systems plugged into this larger platform uh, that would allow people to have better input, more fine grained input into, um, into decisions that are made. Because, uh, you know, today, I think there's this overwhelming sense that governments, representative government doesn't serve us that we have to participate more in our democracies to affect the decisions that most people understand must be uh, implemented, um, that, 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 that the collective understands very well what needs to be done, but seemingly our, our politics are so paralyzed or corrupt that, 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 that important things um, are still being blocked. Um, so there's numerous experiments around the world, like the Apollo one with distributed democracy um, that citizens are trying. They have names like liquid democracy, wiki governance, Lumio, democracy, earth blockchain. There's one called council in Madrid. Um, and what I would say is that, you know, although direct democracy, participatory democracy, self-organization, shared leadership, and direct action are not new ideas. What hackers are doing is showing us what can be achieved to upgrade the quality of Western liberal democracies with these and related ideas, employing digital tech and the power of networks and a hacking ethic. And to the extent that they succeed in this, uh, in this adventure, you know, I think we are going to be able to realize new levels of distributive power a distributed power in our democratic governing structures. And I think that the citizens who use their votes for Brexit and Donald Trump in the last half of 2016 felt that they didn't have much more than these wrecking balls to change and finally demolish the old political economy. But if Western liberal democracies can be upgraded in the 21st century, citizens will have more to work with. Um, and the last thing that I would say about hacking in the democratic sphere is that the new political economy has yet to be created, fully created, let alone fully theorized. Uh, 
you know, Marx was a brilliant theorist who explained industrial production and industrial era capitalism. Uh, he's still very uh, relevant today, but 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 his his analysis is not wholly sufficient for explaining digital era produ production. So both technological and philosophical innovations will be needed, I argue, in the book. But what you see now in the hacking experiments of the last decade is a first cut at the project. You talk in the book about the value and risk of transgressive acts. Mm hmm I devote a whole chapter to it. And, and um, um, I think that's where the narrative nonfiction really allows you to, to sort of reflect and, and uh, and ruminate on these questions in almost at almost a poetic level. Um, and, and in that chapter, I, I do recognize the whole range of hacker acts that are out there, from the plainly dangerous and nihilistic to the highly altruistic. Uh, and I do say that each raises its own difficult policy questions, and society is going to have to grapple with each thorny issue at a time. Uh, the, you, you really can't oversimplify uh, the, the many aspects of, of the, different, uh, the different kinds of uh, uh, policy issues that are raised um, uh, when looking at hacker, uh, what hackers are doing out there. Uh, but to a large extent, society has not even begun to think seriously about these questions. Um, so, you know, should various hacker acts be viewed as incidents of public service? free speech, free association, legitimate protest, civil disobedience. These are very relevant questions today in our political space. Uh, pranksterism, harmless pranksterism, or should they be treated as trespass? We have lots of things in the common and criminal law uh, to, 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 deal, uh, to deal with uh, political acts. Um, they could be treated as trespass, tortious, tortious interference, intellectual property infringement, theft, fraud, conspiracy, extortion, espionage, terrorism, and even treason. Uh, when I was at the 2015 communication camp, um, there were a couple of uh, journalists who, who had just been accused of treason and the hacker community had um, rallied around them and, and, and roundly put down the government's uh, um, initiative to try them for treason. Um, so I covered the way that hackers have been treated legally over the past 30 years or so with successive periods of lenience and, and severe crackdowns. I think we're in a period of severe crackdown right now um, and a very scary one with the Trump administration um, uh, really threatening to lynch and swing uh, people like Edward Snowden and Julian Assange from the highest tree. They've actually used that kind of language. Um, and I observed that how society treats hackers will be part of the dialectic that ultimately determines where we end up over the next century. And one thing that you say in the book that I find really compelling is that um, the most successful democracies manage to um, enact and sort of cling to their constitutions um, but as a conversation that leads to a, a rough consensus. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, uh, I, I mean, this is something that I think about a lot as a Canadian constitutional lawyer, because we've had a lot of constitutional conversations between the English and the French nations within Canada and with the Indigenous nations also. Um, and, and this is this is not new in constitutional theory that 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 constitutional democracy is really a conversation between the constituent parts of a society, the courts, the people in the legislature, which allows them to arrive over time at successive states of rough consensus and and you know it's a moving target uh, the the societal norms and the social contract itself evolves over time through this con conversation and through a successful assimilation of corrective feedback and you know i was struck by the uh, uh similarity to the um uh the tech or uh, or the internet um motto uh 
the, the internet, uh, or rather the Internet Engineering Task Force, the IETF, which informally governs the internet, its, uh, its motto is rough consensus running code. And I think that's a good motto for constitutional democracy too. And really underlying all of that is a commitment to the value of social cohesion and the common wheel. And I think that's something that we have really lost uh, is that democracies demand more of their citizens than monarchies do. And they demand a virtue. And, and that, that primary virtue is the virtue of caring about one's neighbor and one's fellow citizens. Caring about social cohesion is a necessary value to make a functioning democracy. Uh, and, you know, the U.S. has a long tradition of constitutional conversations and of successfully assimilating corrective feedback, uh, although uh, they, seem, they seem lost in the wilderness these days. Um, in, the, in the early days of the American Republic, politics were very rowdy. Um, you know, the Boston Tea Party was one example, but people were pushing back against elected officials and on restraints against populism. Uh, all the time, including the, the founding fathers, uh, the patrician founding fathers wanted to write uh, uh, restrictions uh, on populism into the Constitution. And what the Americans' innovation and contribution to the idea of democracy was, uh, was this new kind of social compact, a constitutional democracy based on popular sovereignty. That is the idea that power resides with the people, not with the monarchy or the head of state, or even the representatives of the people. It, it resides and stays always with the people and can never be taken away from them. Um, so the American democracy, uh, and, and this is a norm which has so much appeal that even in parliamentary democracies like uh, England and uh, those in England and Canada where, where the monarch remains the head of state, um, you know, it's, it's, it's essentially become a norm. Um, so the American democracy was one in which, in addition to the important institutional checks and balances, uh, it had a high, it had a, a tradition of high citizen participation, diverse civil groups, and a foundation of tradition, uh, a, a foundational tradition of civil disobedience. Um, the Boston Tea Party and the Underground Railroad being just two examples of that tradition. And as American democracy evolved, it was distinguished by large social movements, including the anti-slavery movement, the women's suffrage movement, the progressive movement, the civil rights movement, and the anti-war movement of the Vietnam years, um, of Vietnam War years, which profoundly changed relationships, power relationships in the country. Uh, and so I think it's uh, very interesting to think of constitutional democracy as a rough as as a conversation leading to consensus and and um and and i i was interested to also examine how the chaos computer club has navigated the converse, the constitutional co conversation in germany over the last three decades uh, they are a group that have always been at the cutting edge of discussions about tech and society sometimes and they've been public favor sometimes not but over time they have greatly contributed to an informed discussion on cybersecurity and internet governance in Germany. And their work is credited with, uh, um, uh, their work on the security of voting machines uh, is credited with saving the German elections. They convince not only the German government, but also the Dutch government to do away with electronic voting. Um, and this praise is, is not uh, praise that I've invented, in fact, these are the words of the German member of the European Parliament speaking in 2017. That's brilliant. Thank you. Well, Maureen, as we're drawing to a close, um, I want to bring us back to MIT because how could I resist doing that? Um, and your book covers the mainstreaming of the hacker ethos and hacker experiments um, through elite institutions like MIT and, and also Harvard and others. Uh, we have to give them their due. Um, could you finish off by talking a little bit about that? Yes, over the last decade or more, there's been a gradual mainstreaming of hacker ideas and experiments in, uh, in both universities and philanthropic institutions. 
Uh, and in the very last part of the book, I go to see what's taking place in Boston and Cambridge in particular. I wanted to see what was going on there. And I also wanted to talk to academics about uh, how they thought hacker ideas might succeed as a social movement, how hackers and citizens might succeed in building out democracy into cyberspace. And what did they say? Well, uh, very interesting. Many of them were looking at systems theory and this idea of emergence in systems theory. And as it was explained to me, um, emergence is the idea that in complex systems, uh, a small change can trigger huge changes and emergent properties that can alter the whole macro structure. Uh, so you have a property that is not in the micro, but emerges from interaction, uh, sorry, it's not in the macro, but it emerges from interactions in the micro. And uh, a good uh, metaphor for this is, um, you know, the beautiful shapes that a flock of starlings makes when it flies in the, in the evening sky. Um, these are emergent patterns. The birds themselves don't plan or intend these patterns. Uh, they, uh, they only have maybe a few rules or unconscious rules, uh, such as don't get too close, fly ahead, uh, proceed ahead and don't cross, cross paths. Um, but out of these, these, uh, these micro interactions between them, the whole flock pattern will emerge, not as a predestined or a pre-planned um, or imposed thing, um, but rather as a completely bottoms up thing. And, and so this has some very important implications for hacking. Uh, when I began my journey through the world of hackers and, and hacking uh, citizens, um, I, it was my belief that the solution to our problems of concentrated power, mass surveillance and authoritarianism was really a political question of getting enough people, like a critical mass of people to adopt hacker tools and alternatives uh, that would distribute power and, and if you will, do, a, do an end run around existing power structures. But as I spoke with these academics uh, about systems and began thinking more about the views of uh, the early digital rights pioneer, Wa Holland, who was one of the founders of the Chaos Computer Club, um, I began to share their belief that chaos theory might in fact offer the best explanation of how the world actually works. Uh, that re reality is and causality is much less deterministic than people think. Um, so if you look at the history of technology, you see that tech really develops in a haphazard nonlinear way. How various innovations have come about, how they catch on and succeed in different places and different circumstances, is a process that's not wholly determined by the nature of the tech or by the political will of the society. Uh, it, it really hangs on the vagaries of human agency, culture, and to some degree chance. So we really cannot be sure how tech is going to develop next. And therefore, it's more important than ever that people that are concerned about democracy um, that we begin experimenting, that we support experimentation. And in this environment, I think one can see hackers as agents of positive chaos, a term that Walt Holland liked to use. And um, when I was at Harvard, a, a Spanish computer engineer told me something very interesting. He said, hacking is between reform and revolution. It makes reformers happy because it brings reform, but it's, it's not intended to, it, it doesn't break the system. And it makes revolutionaries happy because it's not conforming to the values of the system. And it is hopefully triggering emergent effects that might ultimately break down the system. So you're hacking reform with the hope of changing the whole system. That's brilliant. Well, thank you so much, Maureen. Thank you for your time today. Thank you, everyone who's come to watch. I'm really sorry, but we're not going to have time for questions. Uh, we're strict about our end time because we know that everyone has Zoom fatigue. But thank you for those who did ask questions. Um, I'm going to post uh, the link to the book in the chat again uh, so that you can um, 
purchase it or have a look at it. Uh, maybe you'll find uh, some answers to your questions there. I know some of them Maureen sort of answered as we went along. Um, but thank you so much, Maureen, again. It's been wonderful having you. Uh, thank you, everyone uh, who came along today. We hope to see you all again next week. Bye now. Bye-bye.